you have a young student who would like to participate in reading our scriptures on Sunday morning, we just come talk to me or Aaron and uh, we'll get you set up for that. We want this to be a regular part of our worship, and so we are thankful uh, for the kids that have been doing it for us. Uh, I want to remind you of a couple of things, uh, just because I like clarity, <clears throat> and I know that sometimes when I teach things uh, that, I, that are not Scripture, sometimes I'm not very clear about them. Uh, I know this because every time I try to teach my wife a board game, she says, could you just give me the rules and I read them myself. Um, so I want to I clarify some things. Uh, this morning, during our Come For More classes, which is a great opportunity for you to meet more people and dive deeper into Scripture, uh, we do have a Meet the Elders time in the library. If you're interested, you're newer to the church, and you want to have an opportunity to meet with the elders, uh, we recommend that you come to that. You get an opportunity to ask questions, hear about the church. Uh, it's not a program. We don't have any agenda to come and share anything specifically. It's your time to come and get to know us and, and spend some time with us. So we want to encourage you to do that. Uh, if you are interested in come for more class, there's a list of them out there. They are, just try them out. Uh, if you're not sure, if you want to go to one, but you see one that says, oh, this might be interesting, or uh, that person looks really, really intelligent and knows Jesus a lot just by looking at them, because that's easy to do, uh, just go to their class, all right? And, and we encourage you to do that uh, because it's an opportunity for us to grow deeper in the Lord. The second thing I want to mention is, because Aaron kind of talked about this, we, we would like to reduce announcements in our services to essentially nothing. Uh, and the reason being is because we want to be here to worship the Lord together. And there are things that we want to be intentional about as a church to talk about, especially when we're talking about where we're moving and how we're going. Uh, so we are, we are adding some things to our uh, network of communication that will be helpful to that. Uh, Louis, could you stand up and wave your hand? Uh, this is Louis. Uh, Louis was back here playing bass. He's our communications director in the church. Uh, Louis has been hard at work doing lots of things, and one of those things, or two of those things, I should say, are going to come to fruition at the end of this month. Uh, Louis is going to hold a genius bar for you guys. Uh, it, on the, the last Sunday of September, we are going to launch our church directory and church calendar. Uh, now, what that means is uh, we're going to need a volunteer. Uh, I'm not necessarily looking at you, Kate, but I'm looking at you. Uh, we would like to set up a photo booth. Uh, you guys can come in in your family. You can dress in costumes. I don't care. Uh, but we're going to take your picture. We can put that in the directory. We're going to... The nice thing about this directory is it's an app on your phone. Uh, and you can go in and update the information. So if you're like, wow, that picture of me is terrible, uh, you can go in there and add another picture in there. It allows you to put your kids' information in there. It allows you to protect your kids' information in there. The only way to access that is to get access through the church. So it's a very safe way for us as a church to be able to communicate with each other. And it will help answer some of the questions of, who's that person over there? Uh, you can, I, in Iowa, we had one, and I would meet someone, and then I would walk back to my office, and I would open my phone, and I would go, oh yeah, their name was this. Uh, it was really helpful for me to learn names. Here's the cool thing about that. In that same app, you're going to find the church calendar. Uh, we're going to have a digital church calendar for you. Everything that is going on that is public knowledge, meaning church-wide events, uh, specific ministries that are open to people, will be on that church calendar. So you can open that up and go in there and, and look at the church calendar. The other nice thing is in that same app uh, will be where you will begin to tithe if you tithe electronically already, uh, we're going to switch over to this app. Uh, and now you can also tithe through this. And so we're trying to gather everything together because we think it's important for us as a church to be able to communicate well. Uh, because there's nothing more frustrating as a church person than when someone says, I didn't hear about that. And I was like, it was in the bulletin. It was online. It was in an email. We talked about it up front. What do you want more do you want? Now we want that access into your hand. So we encourage you. Uh, Louis is going to have a little class during Come For More that Sunday to uh, help you install it, to teach you how to use it, to do all of those things. So if you're like, ah, oh, that's scary to me, 
That's Louie's Genius Bar, and we'll be, we're prepared to help you through that. Uh, the last thing I want to talk about is next week, uh, we're going to have a Come For More class to teach how to run our discipleship groups. Uh, so if you've signed up for a discipleship group and you're interested in joining one, whether you want to be a facilitator or not, we would encourage you to take part in this. Uh, we have two weeks of the class. It's only, you only need to attend one to know what's going on. If you're not sure what our discipleship classes are, it's our, we talked about it last week, but this is the way we're going to use, uh, we're going to begin our discipleship training program in this church. This is ground zero of your opportunity to take leadership, ownership of the ministry of WCC and be part of what's going on. So we encourage everyone to be part of it. These are groups of three to five men or women uh, who will meet on a weekly basis. The whole church will be studying the same scripture. Uh, you study every morning. You wake up, or you, like me, you do it later in the day when your brain's on. Uh, you study your scripture, you write in a journal, you meet together sometime during that week, and you share what you've read. And then you pray together and you talk through some things. It's not overly complicated, but we want this to be the stepping stone of what God uses in our church. So we encourage you, if you're like, ah, I, I want to I be part of what WCC is doing, I want to be more involved, this is where you start. Uh, so we encourage you, there's a sign-up sheet out there. Attend the class next week. Um, if you have a small group that you're already running and you're saying, hey, we already have a small group, a bunch of our small groups are actually shifting over to this model, and they're going to use it within the context of their small groups. If you want to know how to do that, you can talk to me about that as well. Now, let's get to the important part, God's Word. So would you pray with me? <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, for all that you're doing in the church. We thank you for the opportunity we've had this morning to worship through offering and music and fellowship. Uh, but Lord, now we get to worship through your word. And so Lord, I would ask that it is not me that is heard, but it is your truth. That the Holy Spirit would speak now. And that you would have an opportunity to share with all of us as individuals and as a church as a whole. And God, you would call us into your kingdom work. And so, Father, whatever you lay on our hearts in this moment, let it be from the Spirit and not from me. Father, we are grateful for all that you do, and we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, we are in John chapter 6 this morning, but I want to I talk about context. Uh, I mentioned this a lot, but I think this passage in particular is very important. If you're not sure how context works in Scripture, I recommend buying a Bible that has no verse numbers or chapter headings. Uh, that will help you understand context a little better because chapter 5 is connected to chapter 6 and chapter 6 is connected to chapter 7 and chapter 7 is connected to chapter 8 and the entirety of the Bible is God's word and it's all connected to one another. It constantly is quoting other scriptures in text, and so it's constantly coming back to each other. So when we think about context, we have to understand where the passage lies in the midst of the book. We have to understand who the book was written to. Uh, and then we have to also understand if someone's talking, who are they talking to? Because what often happens, and I think you have seen this and got frustrated with it, is that the world rips a verse out of scripture and they slap it up and they say, see how awful Christians are. Now I'm going to turn that on you just, just to be aware. I like to do this because, and then sometimes what Christians do is they rip scripture out of context and say, well, look at this blessing for me. And I was like, no, that's, that was for Joshua and his family. Uh, and so we have to be careful to understand who God is talking to. God's Word is living and active and sharper than a two-edged sword. It is for us today. But context matters. And the context of this passage is extremely important because John is writing to all of the new church that's rising up. And John writes in a very specific way. John is telling a story. The other three Gospels are trying to give you these very exact details. John is 
very clearly writing this beautiful picture of who Jesus is and what he calls Jesus' disciples into. And so with that context, we go, okay, well, Jesus is talking. Who is Jesus teaching? Jesus is teaching the disciples, and I'm not talking about the 12. I'm talking about all of the people that have been gone to gather around Jesus because they want to hear Jesus teach and talk, and they want to see a miracle happen. So that's, that's our context this morning, and I think it's important as we look at this. So uh, we're going to start in verse, verse 1. I'm going to try to click through this while I read, but open your Bibles if you got it. Uh, After this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a large crowd was following him because they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick. Jesus went up to the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. Now context. It's important. I want you to take note of several things here. Jesus is being followed by a crowd. Uh, we, don't, we don't know the size of the crowd. We're going to get there in a second. But Jesus is being followed by a crowd. Uh, this is during the Passover, which means what? There's going to be a lot of people in town. This is important. It gives us a time of the year. It gives us ideas of what's going on. It's, it's going to mean that there is going to be green grass and a nice place to sit on the ground. Context. All right, they're following Jesus. Why? Because they'd seen and heard of Jesus' healings. Now, we only, in John, we only hear two. We hear of the lame man sitting by the pool, and we hear of the official son but there, the, the, what is implied here is that Jesus has done many healings up until this point. And so this crowd begins to follow him and they expect something from Jesus. And so we have to kind of address some of these context situations because it's important for us to know what's going on. So we have two accounts of healing. So we know that Jesus has been a healing, but it's the idea here is that they want more. They've seen enough of Jesus to say this guy can do incredible things that only possibly God can do. And they might be showing up as a situation of, I want Jesus to do something for me. I I know he can do something. What about me? And so they begin to gather around him and they begin to show up and they begin to ask questions and they begin to hear his teachings. And so as Passover has started, there are a multitude of people there. And imagine this is a Jew. You you show up for Passover and you hear about the man that is doing things that you've only been taught about and never seen in your life. Because as a Jew, you were raised to know the Old Testament. You were taught it on a daily basis. It was read in your home on a daily basis. It was explained on a daily basis. You went to the synagogues on a weekly basis. Sometimes, as adults, you went on a daily basis. And so they would gather together, hearing God's word over and over again, and they would look for God's promises and God's blessings. And so when a, when a guy shows up and he starts doing all these incredible things, And now there's a huge crowd of people. What happens when a crowd gets moving? You either go along with it or you get pushed along. And and so this crowd shows up and they want to know more. But remember, we're talking context. So we have to go back. Verse 45 and 47 of chapter, verse 45 through 47, chapter 5. Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, on whom you have set your hope. For if you believe Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? Now, I want you to imagine that you're a Jewish person. Who is Moses to you? I want you to consider that, and I'm going to give you the answer, okay? If you combined the greatest president, and I'm not going to tell you who that is because that will just start a fight, all right? Uh, the greatest president of the United States of America with Billy Graham. 
spiritual leadership. Because Moses was both. Moses was the, was the governmental leader of the Israelites as well as the spiritual leader. They came to him for everything. And what Moses did for them was the most incredible thing that they began to, to wrap their lives around. Everything that Moses taught, everything that Moses did, it became central to how they lived their lives as Jews. So why? Because Moses was the man that showed up on behalf of God and freed them out of Egypt. Now who freed them out of Egypt? God did. But what they saw was the man. And so what happened is, he got him out of Egypt. He got him across the Red Sea. He got him into the wilderness. He provided bread from heaven for them. He provided water from a rock for them. He provided the Ten Commandments. In truth, God did all of those things, but what they saw constantly was Moses, Moses, Moses. And so when their expectations were, hey, someone's going to come and lead us. Someone's going to show up and they're going to be greater than Moses. They expect a big deal. And so when Jesus shows up and he starts teaching that Moses was trying to prepare them for him, they have to take notice of this. And to be honest with you, I understand their frustration, right? If you have lived your entire lives thinking that this is the most important person to your faith, this is the most important person to us as a people. Of course, when someone comes in and says, hey, they were lower than I, you're going to be angry about that. You're going to be like, wait, I've set my hopes and my dreams on all of what Moses has taught and prepared for us. And so what does Jesus do? What is the context of this situation? Jesus just explained to them that Moses tells everyone about him and so what is one of the greatest feats that are constantly talked about as an Israelite? Well, Moses provided manna for us. And so what's Jesus do? Jesus isn't about fixing all of your lives. Jesus is about showing you who he is so he can transform you. And so he shows up to the middle of this Jewish celebration, which is all about God freeing the people of Egypt, out of Egypt. It's about God showing up, but what they remember is Moses showed up. And Moses led all of these things. And so now we have Jesus showing up and he's saying, listen, I'm bigger than that. I'm not going to just rescue out of slavery. I'm going to rescue out of sin. And you thought Moses could do something amazing with manna. Watch me. So here we go, verse 5. Lifting up his eyes then and seeing that a large crowd was coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? He said that this to test him for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread would not be enough for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they for so many? Jesus said, have the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place. So the men sat down, about 5,000 in number. Jesus then took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also the fish as much as they wanted. So we have a large crowd amassed around Jesus, and Jesus has been teaching them, right? They, they followed him. He's been teaching, he's been healing, and they're following Jesus around, and, and they are getting hungry because that's what people do. They get hungry. Hungry, And so we're in the midst of Passover, which means people are traveling, which means people are probably sacrificing. And we're not talking about a rich culture either. So food is not just easily accessible. And so now we have this situation where Jesus is sitting with his disciples, and there's this whole large crowd coming, and he turns to one of them and he says, Hey, uh, what are we going to do here? A test. 
a test that was failed. Philip's answer. 200 denarii. The denarii is, one denarii is a day's wage. So eight months. Eight months of saving up would buy enough bread for everyone to uh, essentially take a little tiny piece off and eat it. And so what's Philip's response? It's a head thing. God, this logically doesn't make sense. I, I can't logic this out of my head. We, there is no way that we can provide for all of these people. Okay? Then, Andrew steps up. And, and I, it looks good on Andrew's part for, to begin with. Uh, verse 9. He says, there's a boy here. He's got, he's got five barley loaves and two fish. If he would have just ended it there, it would have been good. Right? But he said, well, this isn't enough for everyone. Why? Why is Jesus testing them? Because Jesus wants them to see who he is. They loved Moses, and they saw God do incredible things through Moses. And Jesus is showing up and saying, I'm greater than he. And he was talking about me. And so he is challenging his own disciples to say, do you believe that I am greater than Moses? Do you believe that I can do incredible things? Now you have to understand that this boy's meal is not five loaves of bread. Okay, five, five barley loaves. Barley loaves are like pieces of biscuity type stuff that's like this big. And these are not giant fish. These are most likely like sardines or something. These are, this is a boy's lunch, right? He's not out to eat this gigantic meal by himself. And so what Jesus calls them into is this understanding of, do you trust me? At the same time, though, he is alluding to multiple things. He's alluding to the fact that Moses over and over again had pointed to him, saying this is the one who is going to come to save you ultimately. Everything in the Old Testament over and over again, it just points to Jesus. It's all pointing to Jesus and his coming. Read it in context about this is what Jesus is. From Genesis chapter one from Genesis chapter three, over and over again, you're going to see Jesus. It may not say Jesus, but he is actively working for the salvation of his people. And so what happens here is he shows up and, and they bring in this little boy. John is very particular about why he tells his story. Why this little boy? Why specifically mentioning barley loaves? Elisha. Back in 2 Kings, uh, took a barley loaf and used it to feed a hundred soldiers. He multiplied the food. God used him to do this. Over and over again, Jesus is saying, you see these things? I can do them so much more. And so while his disciples lacked faith, he's pointing out very clear connections to the Old Testament to say, I, I did this. That wasn't the work of Moses. That wasn't the work of Elisha. That was the work of God himself. And Jesus is trying to declare very clearly to his disciples, you expect too little of me. You don't have faith in me. So what's Jesus do? And when they had eaten their fill, he told his disciples, gather over, gather up the leftover fragments that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. Now, can you imagine? Jesus. 
12 baskets. This little boy shows up with his sack lunch, and out of it, Jesus feeds how many people? Not 5,000. Context. See, this is important. What's John say? How many men sit down? 5,000. Were there kids there? Yeah, that's where they got the lunch, right? Were there women there? Yes. Why do we know that? Because Jesus was always followed by women. Jesus had women disciples. They've always been part of God's picture. And so what happens is, is most likely sitting on this hill are not 5,000 men, are ten to 15,000 people. And they are sitting there with the expectation that this man is going to show up and he's going to do incredible things. And here's the interesting part. I I know this as a pastor of like, if you can get people to sit down and eat and you get the free time to just talk to them, you're going to do it, right? So I guarantee that as this food is being passed out, that Jesus is just teaching them. Now, the scripture doesn't say that, but Jesus was constantly teaching and talking and explaining the glories of God. And so as this food is getting passed out, he's get the, he gets this wide open audience. All right, you want to you want to learn how to teach children well, all right? You either feed them while you're teaching them or you give them something to do. Both of those will work every time. Right? You you let them color while you teach them or you say, "Hey, eat these very quiet snacks." Right? I've learned as as teaching youth, like especially youth like I'm serious. Like a five-year-old is so much more quieter than a high school eating a bag of chips. Uh, so like I had to eliminate bags of chips in my teaching room for high schoolers because I'm like, you guys are just like eating the bag or something because it's just loud. Uh, so Jesus is taking this opportunity to explain. But I, I want you to see this picture here because I, I think these two verses could, could just be like, oh, wow, yeah, God, Jesus showed up and he produced more than was needed. So Jesus is telling us something here. John is being very specific about what he does. Jesus provides in abundance. I, I want you to understand that. What we desire of Jesus, these people showed up and they wanted to see Jesus heal them. And so what's he do? He provides a meal for them because Jesus never does what anyone want, like ask for. He does what they need got a hungry car out and they need fed, but they also need to see God's power because they need to believe, they need to be changed by Jesus. And so what he does is he feeds them in a miraculous way. And in doing this, he shows God's abundance. God's blessings are always more abundant than expected. I want you to think about the blessings of your life. I want you to think about the things that you seek after and ask God for. Are the blessings beyond what you expected? The answer is yes. Why? Because if God just went to the limit, like he just gave us the bare minimum of what we would need, we probably wouldn't have enough to pour out into others. But when God begins to overflow our cup, what happens? We pour out into others. Those of you that have discipled people, that have walked with people, do you tend to find that God brings people into your lives that have walked the same path you, he brought you out of many years ago? Yes. Why? Because God abundantly gives and pours into you to transform you so that what? He can use you for his glory. And so out of you pours out this understanding and this knowledge and this wisdom, and out of you pours Jesus... And so what Jesus is trying to declare both to his disciples, the ones that are going to follow him, that's us today, is that God gives and he gives abundantly. Our expectations in this situation are probably going to be like Philip's and Andrew's. Well, we don't really have enough. Well, maybe here's a little something. But the expectation is so small. When we think about ministries, when we think about our lives, when we think about what we're called to do, do we 
look at Jesus and say, we know that you'll provide, but then we limit it in our faith. Yeah, God can heal, but will he? Yeah, God, I'm going to pray to God to ask for this, but do I believe it? Here's, here's the context you need to understand that over the next few weeks, you're going to see this, you're going to see the beauty of Jesus' work, and people are going to be angry and frustrated and walk away. Why? Because it was so much more than they thought it was. In a good way. But their perception is in their human nature and sin didn't allow them to see God's beautiful provision. God provides and he provides abundantly. Here's the other part of this. God doesn't waste what he gives out. It's not like, hey, we fed all of them. Just leave the scraps on the floor. The birds will eat them later. No, God, Jesus has them gather those things up. And then we don't know what he does with them. But what we do know is that when God gives things to us, he will always use that to pour out more. And it will continue to flow out of us. You're offering to the church. You're giving God his money back. It's kind of a weird uh, thing to think through. right? Everything you own is God's. Are you giving money to support the ministry of the church? Is you giving God his money? I, it's kind of a weird thought. But it, what does God do with that? Well, it, it blesses missionaries. It allows people to minister the gospel. It allows people to work. It, it, it does so many things that you don't get to see. What does God do when he transforms our life, when we begin to dig into the scripture and we start having things impact us in ways that we don't understand? Let me challenge you here. I know I've lived in the Midwest my entire life. I grew up in Illinois. Uh, I lived in Minnesota. I lived in Iowa. Now I live in Wisconsin. I'm like checking off all the, all the Midwest things, right? Uh, in each one of the states do something weird. Let's just be honest about it, right? But why do I say that? Because what I found in the Midwest, and I'm looking at you men, there is, there is something about a, being a Midwesterner that is this nose to the grindstone, work hard, care for our family, take care of everything, be a little gruff about it. And what we don't allow is the transformational power of Jesus to impact us. And so the reason I say this is because we're about to kick off discipleship groups. And I know there's some men in this church right now that are like, there's no way I want to sit around in a room with three to five other men and talk about my life. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand because I just saw your eyes go down. So I already know. Why is that scary to us? Because it has nothing to do with being men. It has to do with like how we grew up and were raised and the culture we live in. Have you read the Psalms? Have you listened to David weep and cry out to the Lord? Dude shared his heart better than anyone I've ever heard share his heart. Why? Because he knew he needed God's provision and abundance in his life. And so what we do as men is we're like, oh, we got this figured out. No, God, what happened in the garden? God created Adam. And he said, oh, it's not good for man to be alone. Because man alone gets dumb. Jenny has supported me so incredibly well, I would not be the place I am today if it wasn't for my wife. But I need other men who will step into my life and hold me accountable. I had a men's group once. Our policy was we show up and punch each other if we walk away from the Lord. It never had to happen, but it came close. God is going to provide abundantly to us in the midst of this ministry. And what's going to pour out of this is, is the elders believe is generations of strong disciples in this church. But it takes you saying, I'm willing to sit with another man 
or another woman and allow them to speak into my life. And it's going to be hard at first. It is not natural to us. Why? Because darkness loves darkness. If we are sinful, we want to hide it. What's, what happens when your kid does something naughty? One time my mom came home. I redecorated the dining room. It took her about a month before she figured it out. There was now these art pieces in this one section of the wall that had been in a completely different place in the house. And one day my mom was walking through the dining room going, why are these here? And then she moved it. And there behind said thing was a giant hole in the wall. I don't remember exactly what my brother and I were fighting about, but one of us put a fist through the wall. And so what did we do? We hid it. We hid it because we didn't, want, we didn't want to get in trouble. And the funny thing is we didn't get in trouble. My mom was like, just go patch the hole. Why didn't you do that to begin with? Yeah, that made sense. Great. Right? And, and, and so when God pours out his abundance to us, it is meant to spur us on into his greater things. God's blessings doesn't mean stuff. God's blessing means more of him. More and more of Jesus. Go, if you're unsure of that, go watch the amazing hour and 45 minute that Malachi made. If you think God's blessing means stuff, you're crazy. Watch the blessing of the word be brought to these people or, and just watch them celebrate. Right? God's abundance is always going to be present and he's always going to use that abundance. He's not going to let it go to waste. And he's always going to invite us into so much more. So the people obviously understood that. They did a great job following Jesus. Everyone just went, yep, that was great, Jesus. Thanks. Now we're, we're on board. When the people saw this sign that he had done, they said, this is indeed the prophet who has come into this world. This is Deuteronomy 18. This is Moses saying, hey, there is coming a prophet. This is a good thing. This is, again, if they would have just stopped here, and trusted Jesus to do it his way, all things would have been good. But the problem is, we never stop in the goodness of God. We never realize the abundance he has given to us. So they go on, and this, perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. Wow, this guy is the promised prophet that Moses talked about. What do they want to do? They want to humanize him. God never wanted Israel to have kings. Why? Who's, the, who's, the, who's, God, who's our king? God is. What, why do you want to be like the world? Jesus is our king. Why do we want to be like the world? And so their reaction to the amazing miracle that Jesus performs is not to submit and follow. It is to say, okay, we gotta put, we got to force this guy under our throne. We want his leadership our way. We want and expect things from him that go our way. And so in the midst of this beautiful abundance, in the midst of God's pouring out this blessing upon them, the expectation was, you need to do this our way, Jesus. Whoa. Yeah, this passage doesn't have anything to do with us today. Does God give to us abundantly? Not stuff, Him. Does He give us opportunities to pour that out into those around us? All the time. Do we want to set Jesus up on our throne? Or do we allow Jesus to reign in the way he is supposed to reign? Because here's the, here's the thing. 
Jesus is going to go on to declare more of his awesomeness. That's just the best way to put it. And it's only going to get harder for the people listening. What Jesus is going to do in your life is only going to get harder from a worldly perspective. The more you love Jesus, the more you stand up for what is good. The more you love Jesus, the more you desire to know truth. The more you know Jesus, the more you desire to share his message with other people. And guess what? The world doesn't love the message of Jesus. They love the idea that Jesus saves, but they don't realize what he's saving them from. We have to be saved from our own sin, and Jesus invites us into a relationship with him, a relationship where he is the king, where he sets the stage, where he does all the blessings, where he does all the leading, where he does all the guiding. And yet, we come into that expectation of like, okay, I want certain things. And what we have to come into the expectation with is, Jesus, I just, wanna, I just want you to abundantly pour into me so I can abundantly pour out. Because here's the thing. This is the cool part about this. There are disciples that listen to this, and what they do, they dug in deeper. Follow the track of these disciples. Other than John it went real bad for all of them from a human standpoint. I want you to understand that. What the disciples did up until the last breath serving the Lord was to advance the kingdom at all cost. And it's hard for us to say, we're going to advance the kingdom at all cost. And we're talking about potentially maybe losing jobs, not lives. Friends or family, that's hard, right? It is, I agree. The world is going to hate us. There's a promise Jesus made. Why? Because the world hated him first. Jesus wants to give to us abundantly, and he wants to pour out, and he wants us to experience, and I think we can easily walk in that if we just trust that he can be bigger than we think he is. Because he is. So when Jesus shows up and says, hey, I got a bunch of people here to feed. Our answer is not, oh, we can't do that. It's okay, how to, what do you want us to do? What do you want us to do? Let's make it our motto. Here I am, Lord. Here I am. Send me. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you. Uh, We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the freedom that he has offered to us through his death and his resurrection, Lord, that all that is required of us is that we believe. We believe in who he is and what he has done, and we make him Lord of our life. That he is king, yes, but he is king on his throne. So, Lord, help us to be excited about what Jesus is doing in our lives. Help us to look forward to the the mass production of Jesus' miracles in our lives to, to see the feeding be true in our lives. In other words, we're looking at things in our midst and we're calling you into works, Lord, that we would understand that you're going to do way more than we were asking. That not It's just not a bite, Lord, but all that we need to be full with leftovers. And so, Father, we want that. We want to walk and experience Jesus in that kind of incredible way. So help us do that. Help us to see that, Lord. Uh, Lord, I just ask that this week that you would remind each one of us individually what it's some of the blessings that you've poured out in our lives and you would let us see them and remember them and celebrate them and be excited about them. Because, God, you are so, so good. And so, Jesus, we love you, and we thank you for what you've done for us. And here we are. Please use us. Father, we pray all these things in Jesus' holy name. You could be seated for a second. Something that pastor said, and it jumped into my brain, and 
Many moons ago, I went to a Promise Keepers rally with men from this church. And the speaker right before lunch talked about prejudices and how you, you fight them in your workplace, in your life. And sometimes you're judgmental on people. And I got separated from the group of 17 guys from this church. And when I got my box lunch and I went and sat on the curb on Wisconsin Avenue, there was a group of guys sitting next to me. And they started talking about the speaker. And one of them chimes in and he says, Bob, what did you think about that speaker? We had introduced ourselves. And I said, I really struggle with prejudice because I work at a prison. And I judge and I Christian inmates. And I don't believe them at times. And I said, it's hard for me to trust them. And it was funny because one of those guys was an ex-con. And he said, I know what you're talking about. And I didn't believe the guards. So God will put the people in our lives if we're willing to open our hearts and our lives and trust. So please think about that this week and think of the many small blessings that God has given you this week in your life.